name is Sam Simmons and um, I'm a behavioral consultant and licensed chemical dependency counselor. And you're probably wondering why I'm talking to you today, but um, I'm, I'm trying to address an issue uh, that I have noticed in uh, the African American community and, and to answer a question. After 20, 30 years in many of our communities and several million dollars of uh, nonprofit money, government money, um, why do we still in urban areas still have some of the continuing issues and disparities uh, in those communities? I understand one of the reasons is the issue of, of oppression and racism and and the uh, whole issue of uh, white supremacy and systems issues. But uh, I'm starting to understand that there might be another core piece that relates to both of those. And what I'm talking about is uh, trauma. And you mean, what do I mean by that? Well, the trauma uh, that we as African Americans, and particularly African Americans with uh, uh, slavery, uh, in our history and in American slavery in our history um, the trauma that started with that experience and the fact that we possibly are still feeling some of the results of that trauma so so the question is what do I mean well I'm, I have a background in mental health and uh, chemical dependency as I mentioned before and I was working with folks with uh, post-traumatic stress and um, you know that's like the response to uh, an emotional or psychological reaction to trauma outside of a person's uh, normal life and that can last for years so that's that you know you have trauma you have that stress but post-traumatic is that that uh, result or that long-term stress after um, the original stress experience where you start having night, continue to have nightmares, cold sweats, dreams, and, and continually to kind of relive the experience. And so I was thinking about now, if you take an individual who's been traumatized as a child and, and they get no help and it keeps coming back up and they start suffering this post-traumatic after the experience and several years after the experience, how would that look like for a people? And it got me into thinking about or running into in my uh, different research to the, this term called complex post-traumatic stress. Complex post-traumatic stress is a long, we're talking about a, a, a system of stress or trauma that happens over a long period of time. We're talking about over years. Examples of that is hostage situations, prisoners of wars, concentration camp survivors, survivors of some of the religious cults, and including survivors of prolonged domestic violence, prolonged uh, child abuse and sexual abuse, and um, organized sexual exploitation. But the one thing is, is now, so if we're talking about long-term abuse, and we're talking about years of slavery, which was never mentioned in post-traumatic stress disorder or complex post-traumatic stress disorder. It's, it, uh, it's like I see some parallels long term over years being traumatized. So, again, in my you know continued a look and answer that question, is there something else going on in the core of why things, especially in the urban community, are not improving but getting worse in some ways? And so that brings us up to what we call uh, intergenerational trauma or multi-generational trauma, which happens and it affects, uh, is a result of affecting generations after the trauma. So the trauma is, uh, when it's ignored and then is not supported or dealt with, the trauma gets passed on to generations. And this uh, first observation of intergenerational trauma came up in probably around 1960s when there was some work done with Nazi Holocaust uh, survivors who were being treated in uh, Canada. 
and this was around 1966, and they started realizing that these, these survivors from uh, the Holocaust had these behaviors or had the way they were responding to their children. They were kind of passing down behaviors that was a result of dealing with that trauma. And um, so I, I started feeling like I was getting closer. And then, then uh, I ran into uh, the situation and, or kept looking into it and came up with another term or another idea around trauma, what we call historical trauma or collective trauma. And, and the way this is defined, because it's a type of intergenerational trauma, because we're talking about folks still experiencing trauma of the generation before because it wasn't dealt with. And in this situation, when we're talking about historical trauma, we're talking about family members who, who haven't directly experienced the trauma, but are affected generations later. Also, we're talking about a trauma, especially historical trauma uh, or collective trauma, that has been focused on a group of people. Like, for example, if we talk about the Native Americans, where uh, one of their scholars is the one who kind of coined this whole concept of historical trauma in 1980s. You know, uh, where a group of people were, were focused on to exterminate. And how that experience of being almost exterminated has had an effect on how uh, each generation has dealt with their children and what kind of trauma has gotten passed down to that. Now, again, some of, of those same individuals, some families fared better than others psychologically. But, but if you think about this historical trauma, especially from a look at Native Americans who, uh, when we look at disparities, have a high level of disparities around diabetes and, and alcoholism and those kind of experiences, their unique experience in America is they were here. That makes their experience quite a bit unique. The rest of us are immigrants of some type. So that got me closer to talking about the African American community or the urban community. So then I ran into a, a book that uh, coined the term post-traumatic slave syndrome uh, written by Joy McGrew. And, and it, what it talked about is the conditions that exist as in consequences of century of chattel slavery. Now, chattel slavery, we've got to remember, chattel slavery, American slavery. Slavery that was done in a way where you treated human beings like cattle. Less than human. And treated them as such. So, so attacking their humanity. And, and looking at how that, that institutionalism of slavery and the continued institutional racism and oppression have resulted in multi-generational adapted behaviors that might not be in the best interest of the community. Some have been positive, reflecting resiliency, keeping hope alive. But there's others that's been harmful and destructive that we as African Americans, always get blamed for. Well, why do you people do this? And why do you people have so many babies? Or why do you people are so violent? Why do you people? Not looking at the, you know, the result of trying to survive in an institution or an environment that excludes you. So this, this idea of post-traumatic slave syndrome became very, very important to me to take a look at that. And, and, and I think that I was, and again, when you look at this, is all still ties back to post-traumatic stress. So stress post-trauma, I guess is a simple way to put it. So, so in looking at this, what did I come up with is talking about to explain this to uh, professionals and even the community for that matter, is I started talking about trauma points. The historical trauma points of the African American condition. And so what do I mean by that? What are some of these trauma points? And you who are watching this video at this point might come up with some more. But I just wanted to come up with at least five to prove my, the two trying to at least stimulate conversation. It's not about if you believe me or if you agree with me, but we need to have this conversation. 
So where we start with Trump? Well, we start with slavery itself. Then we look at Jim Crow or post-slavery. Then we have what we call the northern migration and the new ghettos. And then we have what we call the ghetto welfare state. And then we have hyper-ghettos. And I'll explain what I mean by all of that. Now, as I mentioned before, American slavery or chattel slavery is, is where individuals become personal property. They're bred, they're, they're sold like a commodity. If you want to get the best information on African Americans, you look at uh, uh, the ship's supply records, property records, and they will and, and they have meticulous information on how many males, females, babies that they had on the boats, on the ships. So now, now let's think about that. Now that also makes, means that African Americans with slavery in their past have a unique experience in terms of America too because they were one of the few who came here. They, weren't, they didn't migrate here. They were brought in the bottom of a boat for the, for the sole purpose of slavery. Now, there are some of the historians out there who say, well, African Americans were here in America, free African Americans. That's absolutely true. So that's why I emphasize African Americans with slavery in their past. First slaves came in uh, 1619. The first 20 slaves arrived in Jamestown, Virginia. So, so I can, you know, I can go further on that, but we're gonna we're gonna continue. So that's the first trauma point. So now we have what we call post-slavery. Post-slavery is after, uh, you know, slavery was ended after the Civil War. Um, we call it the Jim Crow era down south where they had uh, the Jim Crow era started, the legal enforcement of segregation, sharecropping because, you know, uh, who's going who's gonna to deal with the crops? And up to this point, you know, uh, the south had free labor, which was part of the reason for the war, uh, that economic peace. That's also around that time when the Ku Klux Klan started. Also, the interesting thing is, is when we started having an increase in lynchings. You're not going to, the interesting thing about lynchings is if you think about during slavery, there wasn't a lot of lynching of, of, of slaves going on. They did lynch them, to prove a point, but they were worth money. After slavery, African Americans, especially African American males, was not worth money much unless they were working on somebody's farm and is and, and so it's no surprise that you have this high increase after that starting around 18 and keeping records in 1882 to 1964 the numbers that they know of is almost 5,000 lynchings and we know that there's many many more not accounted for and the north you can't they had a, a, on record over almost 220 lynchings on record and the most infamous is the one in Duluth Minnesota in 1920 so then we get into the great migration folks are, don't want to work on the farm they don't want to share crop they don't want they're tired of being mistreated so they go to the north to start working trying to work in some of the factories up north and once they got up north, they noticed that they were also being uh, segregated in housing and employment because they were competing with whites, poor whites, for the same jobs. And so they would get, they would start at a lower wage, they would start at the lower end, but they still had jobs and could make good money. During that time, a uh, majority of the uh, African Americans who came to the North, they all lived in the city. So we're talking about Chicago, we're talking about uh, Detroit, we're talking about all the new large cities. We're talking about New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia, Great Migration. And so, and so during that period of time, but again, you still had to, to struggle and you still had to fight. You know, we had uh, the Great Chicago Riots, and this was true even after men went to fight in World War One and War Two, and, and thought they were free and came back here and was it didn't get the full GI Bill as others. So the the trauma continued. And then we have in the 1968-69, we got the uh, where uh, African Americans start being able to receive welfare. And then with the welfare, you had no men allowed rules. And so, and in those, those neighborhoods, 
You know, and some people argue about how beneficial it was welfare over the long run. A lot of the, the different movements we see in the community were more, more about the moment, short term. So, and so what we're talking about during that time is also uh, around 69, 72, those industrial jobs that brought African Americans into the middle class started to decrease. Then we start having issues with the education. And some people say we always had issues with education in some of our communities. And then we start having the increase in crime towards that 1975, going towards the 80s. Family, you know, middle class, the uh, African Americans around that time because we have the, most of the civil rights laws have come into pass. So folks who could move out the community did. And, um, and so those things had a great big tour, toll on the inner cities. So we call that the ghetto welfare era. So that's 1968, almost to present. Then we had the, the development of the hyper ghetto. What do we mean by the hyper ghetto? Well, we're also talking about that time during the time when they started uh, loading up prisons with black men. Even though, actually, what I missed when we go back to uh, after slavery, and we're talking about slavery, there's a, a movie called Slavery by Another Name. Right after slavery is when we started locking up black men by the by a great number almost one year after slavery was over almost a million me black men were imprisoned so we continue with that so we get to the hyper ghetto we got in 1975 to uh, uh present we're talking about the exodus as i mentioned before uh, of the middle class and and an extreme concentration of private uh, poverty underprivileged groups the concentration of police presence the war on drugs one more time hmm. Blacks and whites selling drugs and using drugs at the, approximately the same rate and going to jail 20 times more likely. Black men are 20 times more likely than white men to go to jail. So now if you lock up all these men, then what do we did? So if you lock up all these men, now you have that behavior of prison is now in the community in, in, turn, in sense, hyper ghetto. So let's talk about trauma and trauma response in, in relation to what I have been uh, discussing here around historical trauma in the African American community. So a typical trauma response is where folks have a experience um, and they get into the fight or flight and they respond to the experience, you know, those old stories about lifting a car, you know, the adrenaline rush, lifting the car off of off the top of a child and not being strong enough to do that. Otherwise, that's that adrenaline rush that gets going during that trauma response, high heart rate. And the common trauma response would be to discharge after everything's over, calm down. You start noticing people crying. You get the shakes. You know, uh, you just like need to just sit by yourself. That's that's a, a natural trauma response to threat. Fight or flight, react, calm down. So, but now, what if that trauma response is interrupted, where you're not allowed to heal or a lot of allowed to recover? And what can cause that? Well, some of the things that can cause that is you don't want to appear to be out of control. We see that with men. You know, get a grip on it. Get over it. You know, get over it. You've heard that one? Get over it. And we say that a lot in, in, in the community. Situation or priority is like I don't, I don't have time to stop. You know, I have to tend to my children. Uh, I have to continue on the grind. The next one would be uh, ongoing threat, reoccurring violence, reoccurring abuse, like such thing as racial uh, microaggression, oppression, it never stops. The situation, there's continue, always on guard. You live in an environment that uh, 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 has violence when you go out your house, and maybe in some cases with some of our young people, they got violence in the house, outside the house, and inside, and, and, and yeah, in the community, and it continues. 
So the denial of the traumatic event by others. In other words, people say, you know, again, get over it. Uh, you sure that really happened? Are you over responding? So that makes you decide that you shouldn't. So basically they're saying you shouldn't even be responding that way. Sounds familiar? So what happens if you are not allowed to recover, not allowed to calm down, and you're always on edge? You can get stuck in what we call flight or flight. You never really calm down. You're always on edge. You show agitation. You're hypervigilant. You have difficult relaxing. You might even have a hard time holding a job, managing your anger, managing your fear in daily encounters with dis uh, discrimination and racism. You consciously or unconsciously expect to be mistreated unfairly. You have difficulties or tendencies to, to connect dots that are not there. Yes, connect dots that are not there. She must be cheating on me. He didn't respect me. And we're talking about, like, for example, if somebody just accidentally step on your shoes and all of a sudden you feel disrespected. That's a dot, connecting dots that are not there. But you're always on hyper alert. How does that look like in children? You see hyperactivity, difficulty sitting, concentrating, compulsive talking, truancy, running away, bullying, stuck in fight or flight. That's what it looked like. Sound familiar? So, look what it, so what's the opposite of that? If I'm stuck in... A disassociated state. In other words, I'm still almost look like I'm stuck in depression. I'm always kind of down, have that look, that empty look on a regular basis. So we, we, we see depression, emptiness, detachment, difficulty defending oneself, inability to connect dots, the reverse of what we talked about before, the inability to connect dots that are right in front of you, like failing to notice that your child's been missing for a couple of hours when somebody brings a child back because you're so down and so stuck in front of a TV, just looking, staring, feeling hopeless. And what do you see and how does it look like in children? Difficulty processing information, feeling like a loner, excessive shyness, clinginess. Hmm. Sound familiar? So if we continue with this stress and we never get a chance to calm down, we never have a chance to recover, not just with the stress, but with trauma. Just think about when have African Americans really been able to make peace with the trauma they have experienced that has been passed down generation after generation. Some of us, again, have done well and don't show as many of the difficulties in terms of, of dealing with trauma. But... What is that? What, so what does it look like? What has it resulted in? Well, we have what we call survival stress management. What is survival stress management? The process of adapting to stressful situations by acting or reacting without thinking of the consequences of our choices. Our choices. Immediate satisfaction, instant self-gratification, resulting in increased trauma and depression. Remember back earlier in, in when I was speaking and I was talking about post-traumatic stress and Joy McGrew was talking about those adaptations, some positive in terms of resilience, but those negative ones, that's the ones we're talking about right now. What does it look like? Well, when we're talking about doing survival stress management, we're talking about air, all my choices is based on the moment. Based on the moment. So now we're talking about using things like sex, drugs, Fast money, gambling. So anything, any means necessary to feel good right now. It's like it's like having a you know you 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 got your rent money, four hundred dollars for rent. You got a one year old, and I see this with some of my guys. You got a one year old, your firstborn, your boy, and you spend four hundred dollars on a on a birthday party for a one year old. You came and afford to then, and then talking about it, you had to do that. That's not about the child. That's about you. That's about how you trying to feel, fulfill the need of not even having a birthday party or being felt like you are, you've been dealt with insignificantly or not having a parent around. Because a one-year-old, if you get you a hostess cupcake and put a candle in the middle of it and, and brought some little presents and sat them in the middle of the floor and made them feel special, they will be happy. That's about what, five, six dollars? 
Or let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex. What we have found in some situations, in, and, and it's not just in the African-American community, but I'm talking about the African-American community because I'm an African-American male. You can have all the sexual education in the world, but if you're using sex as stress management, when it comes down between not having sex or not having a condom, which one you think is gonna which one you think is gonna happen? And then we talk about, you know, how do people continue to have kids irresponsibly? Well, when you're not thinking about long term consequences because you're always living in the moment. Always living in the moment then you end up with more kids than you can handle. But at the same time, if you wasn't raised with your father or your mother or felt abandoned, you try to make that relationship work because of the child, not because of how you feel about the other individual. Then we have this issue of increased domestic violence, increased inability to have healthy relationships. So, what it also it results in the loss of the resiliency narrative. What do I mean by the resiliency narrative? You have resiliency and you have resiliency. You have resiliency that's just surviving and then we have the resiliency that has hope. I asked the young man, he says, Mr. Simmons, we're resilient people. And I said, what does that mean? We're like roaches. We ain't going nowhere. Not going nowhere. Hmm. But I see resiliency as something that there's hope for the next generation. And what I do now is not just for me. Yeah. So, this, you know, I know that some of this stuff is probably maybe makes sense. Um, some some of it might sound like I'm blaming African Americans for their present condition, but that I'm far from it. What we're really talking about is conditioning conditioning of being abused, historically being abused and traumatized and not taking time out or taking the time to address that trauma generation after generation. And I understand that. So, uh, let's look at young black men between the ages of 18 and 40. And the reason I like to focus on this particular group, this particular group would have been little children or, or little children or their grandparents might have been little children or their parents might have been little children or born during the crack era. The crack era. Remember I was talking about that hyper-masculinity? The crack era. Crack era between 1984 to 1990 roughly. So, so what's the significance of the crack era? Well, when we talk about trauma, the historical trauma, over all the years of, the, of being abused as African Americans, being traumatized, trying to fit in, and some of us make it and some of us not, one of the things we can count on is the black women in our community. Black women in our community have been will have been the part of our community that stick and stay. And we have black men who was stick it was around too, it stayed around too. But why is the crack era so significant? Because it was the first drug that had a major significant effect on the black women in our community. Our men already started being either taken from the community or leaving the community, or just feeling less than and not feeling like they can offer their family what they should as a man, which also kind of take, took them out of the community, at least emotionally. But the mothers was the last bastion. The mothers, the grandmothers, were the last ones to look after the prize of our community, the babies. And so now when we get crack era, then where is the babies supposed to defend on? So when you start talking about African American males and females, we can't figure. It. See, one of the things that just boggles my mind: we done spent over the last twenty years focused so much on black men that we forgot about black girls. They need their daddies just as much as black men or boys. In some ways, they need their daddies earlier in the process to let them know that they are worthy even without a man. That's the man who says, you are beautiful, you are important, 
And think about it. If they're not getting that, and the focus of their moms is on the boy, they're not getting that, then don't be surprised with the behavior you see. Because everybody wants to be loved, and everybody wants their own. So let's go back to this example of the black males. So, 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 so now we got these black males, and then, you know, when we talk about males, males' pain don't get dealt with. You know, because like I said, the kids got abandoned during the crack era. The boys were put on the corner by us old dudes. Let's look out. Them young cats decided that they could take over the drug game themselves. Because when they started locking us old dudes up, they don't need us. But we're talking about babies. Babies who were scared 24 hours a day. Scared people with guns will kill each other. And so now they feel abandoned by us. They ain't trying to hear us. They feel abandoned by their moms. I get guys in my group who talk about, and then think about it. We're in a community that says you cannot say bad things about your mother. So how do I sort through that? The pain. One guy said, you know, I used to have to, I used to check my mother's purse, my auntie's purse to make sure that I didn't see a rock. I was so worried. We're talking, we, we, we're, we're dealing with a generation of girls right now. And I know I'm probably talking about, but a generation of girls who were, who were given up to get rock. So we have a whole generation of young people who feel abandoned and you wonder why they ain't trying to listen to us. But let's go on. So these young men often feel socially and economically that the, edu the uh, social and economic and the educational system does not exclude does not include them. They have little or no healthy involvement in the mainstream life. You know, that fosters healthy self-esteem, success, and a hope and future. So, we, so let's talk about hyper-masculinity. We already talked about hyper-ghettos. Now, so without, what, what do I mean by hyper-masculinity? We're talking about masculinity that's over the top. Emotional numbness, fear. And shame and do so you're afraid all the time, but you can't talk about it because part of being a black man and or being a man in general, but being a black man is not being afraid. What do I mean by that? Well, I remember I had a guy in my group who said, you know, Mr. Simmons, when I talked, asked him about being a man and masculinity, he says, man, he says, I remember when my uncles took me to Lake Michigan and I was four years old and threw me in the Lake Michigan and said, swim. I couldn't swim. I was scared to death. And I asked them, why did you do that? And they said, well, we just want to make you into a man. You ain't got time to be afraid. Hmm. If you can't deal with your fear to the point where you done numbed it and shut it down, when you shut down fear, you shut down parts of who you are, which makes it difficult to, to love, to be happy, so hypermasculinity, dislike of women, only for what only like women for what they give you, and how you can use them. Highly have a high uh, threshold for physical pain, but very little threshold for emotional pain. Put a lot of time in your sexual polish on how well you can have sex to prove your manhood, and take on all the negative parts of the hip hop life. All that, you know, videos with the naked women and, you know, you know, pop them booties and all the other kind of stuff that you see in those in those negative sides of hip hop. So so now if we got this going on, this whole example, what did that result in? It resulted in these young men having post poor emotional regulations. Remember we we're talking about stepping on your shoes and talking about disrespect and probably kill somebody. Detachment issues. Issues with female dependent. Rites of passage is involved dealing with uh, traumatic and stressful events, incarceration, unplanned pregnancy. Feeling like they have nothing to lose. Not responding successfully to traditional programming and efforts. Now, we talk about now, I'm talking about the urban community, African Americans, but this is true to a certain degree with my young people who got college educations. You go to some of the uh, 
Historically black colleges, we have a high STD rate in those colleges. Those dudes are, you know, flipping and tripping with the women as, as much as the brother you see on the hood that you say is so out of control. So the trauma doesn't go away because you've got more education or more money. It just, you can cover it up better. It's like having it's like having a rusty Cadillac and putting a brand new paint job on it. It looks pretty, but it's still rusty. So, some more results. So, so now we got this so this whole self-destructive kind of behavior going on because what I call indirect suicide. When you do, all of a sudden you don't have these individuals who who don't have this respect for life, and what and where does that come from? Well, think about it. In some of these communities with all this violence, after a while you get numb to the violence. After a while, you get too used to the violence. So the it, so going to jail doesn't stop you from doing destructive behavior. The threat of dying doesn't stop you from destructive behavior. Because you're so shut down emotionally because you haven't been given skills to deal with the trauma that you have experienced or time to deal with it. So we got the drug use, self-medication. It's about self-medication. The whole and it's been that way in our, in our community for a long time. Drugs have a different relationship in, in, in urban communities. Economic identity. The, the the whole glorification of homicide and what I call the glorification of death. Little respect for life, but more praise, getting more praise in death. I call it the Tupac Biggie syndrome. Bigger than life and death. Ex experiences where you have a man who all of a sudden have their first suit. The, the prettiest coffin. The biggest party. And you do that enough in a community and young people see enough funerals like that and they, and they see that that person is actually getting more credit, more attention. Even the family, more attention from the news media. Some attention is better than none. We noticed that in reality shows. Hmm. And now you got young people who got rest in peace t-shirts. People making money off of a whole collection on their wall. Wall of death. And we okay with that. We're not paying attention. So now let's talk about obstacles to community healing. Well, the first one of the first obstacles is the, the idea that um, the stigma behind mental health or mental illness, you know, addressing emotional health. Because I think emotional health is one of those areas that we really need to address, you know. Uh, Mental illness is full played man, but the emotional health, before we get to the, the mental health part. You know, we're thinking that going to get help is considered weak. We should be able to shake it off. African American, you know, African Americans, it's part of American life to suffer. You know, turn to your faith to help you through. Yeah. We don't trust health professionals, and we have a long history of that. But a lot of it is rooted in old research and old mistreatments. Um, that gets in the way. Our difficulty in terms of addressing trauma. We don't like to talk about trauma. We don't like to talk about pain. What goes on here stays in here. What goes on here stays in here. What goes on here stays in here. An example of that, we, and I understand why we did that, because back in the day, under, under our situation of dealing with uh, institutional racism, you know, like back in the, the, the welfare area, you know, you did what's what have a man to get benefits, but you know, you got your man, and they used to have social workers in the black community that sit on the corner that, at about 8 o'clock in the morning to see who would come out the back door. What man came out the back door? They policed it a lot different. So the kids couldn't talk about who, if, if the daddy was at the house. There was a reason. 
But now the issue is that we got abuse going on in the house and the kids can't talk about it. And then you want to get mad at the children when they, when they come up with this whole thing about no snitching. Not only do it, it might be deadly, but it could also get you disowning the family. Let's talk about that. I usually tell this story about Uncle George. The Uncle George story is, starts like this. Uncle George is 85 years old. He just died. Had a long life, you know. Great member of the church. And Uncle George just died. And we got the funeral going on. And there's this cousin, female cousin, who hasn't been around the family in 20 years. She shows up. Everybody's surprised. And so, the female cousin shows up. We have this great funeral of Uncle George, because Uncle George, now the thing is about Uncle George, Uncle George was that uncle that they would tell little girls, don't sit on Uncle George's lap. That's the Uncle George I'm talking about. See? And the reason that cousin hadn't been around 10 years, 20 years, she accused Uncle George of sexually assaulting her, and the family turned on her. Trying to save face can't deal with the trauma. So, after the funeral, the women go in one room and the men go in another room. All of a sudden you hear this blood curdling scream out of the room with the women. What happened? Well, they realized that Uncle George had sexually assaulted three generations of women in the family. Family secrets. Generational trauma continues to be treated as a secondary issue amongst the mental health field. The historical impact of slavery has a tendency to be uh, dismissed and irrelevant and the European American will often, Americans and a lot of times will often try to define the experience of black Americans instead of allowing black Americans to define, define their own experience. Then we have the issue of lacking insurance but the bigger obstacles is those belief systems our inability to deal with the truth because we believe if we start dealing with the ugly truth in our community as a result of the mistreatment now remember it's not because we are born to be bad people and there is something physically wrong with us be it as a result of the long-term historical mistreatment remember we won't deal with the issues on how we might treat each other in the community and how some of that is stopping us from moving forward because we don't want to have the mainstream society turn that and flip it on us well guess what they're already flipping it on us when you deny things everybody but you know that you that you ain't telling the truth and you know that it's like being in the community and, and, and having a, a, a friend or a girlfriend, you know, uh, who act like they don't know that their, their significant other is messing around. You know they ain't telling the truth. But, but you let them go on and act like it ain't happening because it, it's easier that way. We got to get past that. So how do we promote some healing? Promoting healing, we gotta is, is, is we have to begin by telling our story, acknowledging and naming what has happened to us over this whole generation, expressing the pain, reflect reflect on the pain, learn how to forgive. It's interesting how we can be one of the most religious people in the country, but we have the most difficulty with forgiveness. How do you do that? Forgive. And you can't forgive if you don't start dealing with the pain because you don't know what to forgive. African American institutions and community leaders and health professionals must encourage and promote participation in mental health services. As a matter of fact, even get involved as professionals to restructure the mental health services so it better, has a better outcome with us as African Americans so that we can deal with that stigma. And we need to have compassion and accountability. What is compassion and accountability? The system has a tendency to deal with us with a high accountability without very little compassion. We sometimes will do the same thing, as somebody said to me. Sometimes we're harder on our own folks than other folks are. But then sometimes we're too compassionate and don't hold folks accountable. 
We have to do both. Compassion accountability means I hold you accountable, but I explain to you how I why I held you accountable, and I also give you some information so that you can make some real change in your life without without shaming you. So providers and leadership need to develop mental health supports as we're talking about educating the community around stress management and how to deal with the aftermath of trauma. You know? And and be believe and, and be able to listen. Don't tell folks that's just an excuse or you should you you should be able to get over it. And we need to reclaim a narrative of resiliency, a narrative of hope. How do we establish that with our young people? Our young people and we talk about well they don't listen and they don't want, but they really are, they want to listen, but they also want us to tell the truth. Talking about the good old days, I lived the good old days. They wasn't all that because the trauma continued then too. So the question is, how do we? heal the village because that's where we were really talking about how do we use or address trauma in the community and how does that benefit us you know because it, it how does that benefit us because when we're talking about historical trauma and we're talking about the results and some of the examples I use I think that's that one area that could really give us so a real strong hold on sustainable change in uh, urban communities and communities of, of African Americans and other communities for that matter. But when, you know, so when we're discussing, you know, the, the disparities within the African American community, you know, such as violence, drugs, poverty, and uh, emotional and physical and spiritual health, you know, we often... Uh, discuss them from the standpoint of you know how to from that standpoint of how the systems and um, oppression affects us. That external. How does the external affect us? And and then the other piece is that comes up when we're not talking about the external pieces. The other uh, so-called problem comes up is. Um, African American men, what we're not doing, what we should be doing, how are we suffering, and that kind of thing. But one of the things that we often overlook is trauma, and in 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 and we don't address it because I know one of the reasons we don't address, it, especially African American men trauma, you know, let alone the community trauma, is that in America we don't address men's trauma across the board. Uh, and then definitely not African American men's trauma because if you look at the TV, you look at radio, you look at all media, African American men are a problem. We're always seen as a problem, we're always seen as scary, so we're always seen as causing trauma. But we're also human beings. We've all been children. And children who get traumatized and you don't find a way to address that trauma will grow up a lot of times and either traumatize themselves or the people they love the most. And so they, what happens is the trauma gets passed on to the women they love, the children they love, the community they love. And without addressing that trauma, then it, it, then it becomes difficult to have a full experience of health and success that we all like to have as just as human beings in general. And with that in mind, uh, in 2009, um, me and another gentleman decided to have a conference or start a conference. And the name of that conference was Community Empowerment Through Black Men Healing. Now, when we made that title, Community Empowerment Through Black Man Healing. That's an interesting title from the standpoint that folks had a problem with it. 
They had a problem with it. Community empowerment through black men healing. And it's like, uh, interesting. I remember a friend of mine, a, 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 a black woman that I, or an American woman that I have a lot of respect for, she came up to me and she says, uh, why are you focusing, you always focus on black men. You always focus on black men. And black men healing, they cause so much problem in our community. And, you, and, and you're talking about them healing? I said, whoa, whoa. If the idea is, is every time we turn around and we focus and we look at as black men as one of the problems in the community because they're either they're not there or they are causing pain, I thought that there would be a right, a good place to start. Because let's think, if we ended up with healthy African-American, emotionally healthy African-American males, you wouldn't feel obligated to try to fix them, and then you could deal with your own pain and trauma. You know who the beneficiaries of, beneficiaries of that would be? Is our children. So the mission in 2009 of these conferences was to give an alternative way of thinking about community building from the inside out and not from just the outside in. By addressing inter, inter, intergenerational trauma that are barriers to healing, collaboration, sustainable change, and community empowerment. It also would then create an environment of collaboration and wellness, compassion, accountability, and community-based solutions in partnership. In partnership with the community well, and service well, providers. We just went on a, a hope and a prayer that if we put it together, they will come. And 135 people came to the first car with, you know, with this better understanding of the link between a generational trauma and historical trauma when it relates to disparities in the community. Now it's time for us to take this awareness and promote that collaboration that we're trying to encourage. Promote that sustainable change and, com and promote... We realize that a stronger, thriving African American community improves the health of the community and the society as a whole. So, this is why we started the conference, because we're trying to start a movement of healing from the community, inside out. That doesn't mean that we still shouldn't address institutions that oppress us, but we have to do both, because it's time. We have to do both. Again, it's time.